Good morning. Pastor Mark Driscoll here from Oakdale Free Methodist Church. Glad that you're here with me today. I hope that you're ready for, <coughs> excuse me, for a good day. And I hope you're ready to walk with the Lord today, step by step. And uh, let's join together in prayer, and then we'll move into the Word of God. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and for your sufficiency. Lord, we've been learning that uh, you're all we need. We've been learning, Lord God, that um, the things of this world simply don't satisfy, and we don't really need them. What we need is you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence with us, for your forgiveness of our sins, for your uh, union with us through the Holy Spirit, and for the fellowship of people that you put in our lives. Thankful for your Holy Word and all the ways it shows us how to, look, how to know you. Lord Jesus, we don't, um, we don't want to just read your word and, and learn verses. We want to know you. Your word is, is a meeting place. Your word is a place where we, where we contact you and we hear what you have to say and we, and we speak back to you, Lord. And so in this time, Lord, we want to meet with you in your presence, in your love. I pray for every person listening right now, Lord God. Every person, uh, whether they be sick, lonely, hurting, busy, active, uh, celebrating, whatever is happening in their life today, that this would be a day uh, that we would say this is the day the Lord has made and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. May we hear from you today. May we draw from your strength and walk in your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ being enough. You know, years ago, I, I may have shared this before, years ago I had an experience where, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that while the Bible is the primary means by which we hear from God, and everything that, that we think about, uh, everything we believe in needs to be measured by the Scripture, and even that, must be measured by Jesus Christ. You see, he's the standard by even, even by which the scripture is read. Uh, there are people who will read things in the Bible that are totally against Jesus. And it's hard to imagine that, but it's really true. So, so the scripture is our primary source for hearing from God. Jesus Christ is our primary filter through which we interpret the scripture. If it doesn't line up with him, then we're getting it wrong. Now, the other, anyway, I, I believe strongly that God speaks to people by His Spirit in their heart and their mind. And it's always going to be in accordance with His Word and always going to be in accordance with Jesus and who He is. Uh, in Revelation it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, that God speaks consistently through His Son and through His, His written Word and through the living Word. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you all that, God has spoken to me in, in times. And, and one time in particular I was... I was in ministry. I was in another church in another town, uh, and I was really having a bad day. I was driving home, and I was from work, and I was frustrated and irritated, and I was just just tired and angry and, and just all kind of stuff and things in my mind and, and conflicts in the church and conflicts in life and my own sense of inadequacy. And the Lord spoke to me as clearly as I'm speaking to you. And he said, and there's no denying this, there's no denying it. He said, Mark, when are you going to accept my love? I I just was blown away by that thought and that, wait a minute, that's I wasn't even thinking about that. I'm thinking about all these church conflicts and stuff. And what all of a sudden now I hear this voice saying, When are you going to accept my love? And that has so many applications in my life. I've never forgotten that moment. But I'll tell you, one of the things that it makes me think of today is how I can get so busy. I can get so wrapped up in the idolatry of all of my activity. I can get so caught up in all of the importance of my self-importance that I lose touch with the simplicity and the, the, uh, the uh, all-sufficiency of knowing Jesus. Really, I mean, just knowing him, you know, my life is not about preaching the gospel as much as I love to preach. That's not what my life's about. 
I love church. I love doing church stuff. I love living in the church and with the people of the church. I love preaching and teaching and ministry and seeing people, you know, saved, healed, delivered, all that kind of stuff. I love that. But that's not where my life is. And sometimes I have to be reminded of that. Sometimes I can get so caught up in all the stuff I'm trying to do in life that I forget that my life is really about one thing, and that's knowing Jesus and making him known. That, that my relationship with Jesus Christ is, is the, the source of my life. So sometimes I'll even ask myself this question. I'll say, uh, Pastor, I'll look in the mirror and say, Pastor, um, if you weren't a preacher, if you weren't a pastor, you didn't have a church, you weren't preaching online and getting people to come in, and you weren't doing all this kind of stuff, where would you and Jesus be? And buddy, I'll tell you, sometimes that's a hard, that's a sobering question. I mean, I'm just going to take take these off for a minute. Sometimes, you know, um, it makes you guy it makes a guy think. And if you're a preacher, you you need to think about this. I mean, if I was not a minister of the gospel, quote unquote pastor, teacher, Bible teacher, online, whatever that is, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I've gone overseas, and I've preached overseas, and I've written three books, and I can talk about all this stuff. And, and I thought, what, what if I didn't have any of that? What if I woke up tomorrow, and all, and all I had was my life, and, and my home, and my family? Would I still be as passionate about Jesus Christ as I am right now? Or am I just passionate because it's my job? And I, I'm trying to be hard honest here. I've had to spend some time. I've had to, to ask the Lord, God, where's my heart here? Where's my heart? And every now and then, you know, when you're in ministry, but even as a Christian, whether you're ministry or, well, you, you know what I'm talking about. And so anyway, look, we have to search our hearts sometimes. We have to look inside and say, what am I leaning on? What am I really, really depending on? And to, to, to not only to save me, but what am I depending on for the way I live my life? What's it about? Um, if ministry is just my job, then I've got a problem. Um, if it is the chief joy of my life, I've got a problem. <clears throat> it should be an expression of my relationship with Jesus, right? I mean, preaching ought to be, must be, an expression of my relationship with Jesus, and, and, and if I ever forget that, then I start trying to please people. Or I start trying to make a name for myself. Or I start trying to build a movement under my name and wave my little flag and build my little religious empire. And you know, it, you, you can fall into that so easily. And you know what? You don't even have to be a preacher to fall into that. You can be a, a person who just has a regular uh, other kind of life and they're not really leading anything but you go to church you're a Christian you can kind of build up your own little empire that way too because if it starts becoming about about anything except him and, and he begins to take second place to what you're doing for example or he begins to take second place to your own personal philosophy of life then we got a problem and so what I want to do is, is talk about that because it, it's, it's ironic I woke up with this on my mind this morning I woke up God what am I doing what am I doing and why? And then I look in, 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 in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10 is where we're preaching today. And it, it hits right into that. I want to read it to you. And then we'll back up and we'll talk about it like we always do. Listen to this. <clears throat> Starting in verse 6. Uh, Paul has, has uh, begun to, to delve deep now. He's, he's done the introduction of who Jesus is and how adequate he is. And now he's kind of moving into what some of the problems are. But no matter how much he moves into the problems, he can't get away with stopping and telling you who Jesus is and how adequate he is. Because whatever your problems, Jesus is adequate. Let me read it. Verses 6 through 10. Listen to this. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. <clears throat> See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority." Now, if you broke this down into parts, first you have uh, 
Paul telling us what we need to be doing. Second, you have Paul telling us what we need to avoid. And third, you have who Christ is and who we are in him. And that's really the essence of what we're talking about today because here's the thing. My title of my message today is uh, the way you came in is the way you go on. The way you came in is the way you go on. And here's what I mean. Let me just read verses 6 and 7 again, and I'll tell you what that means. He said, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, how did you receive Jesus Christ the Lord? Let me, let me just ask you that question. If you know him, if you've received him, ask yourself, how did you do it? I often ask people, how did you, how did you receive Christ? Well, there's only one way to receive Christ. And that's now there's a lot of a lot of doorways into that way, but there's one way, and that is through repentance of sin and faith, right? And and the, the keystone, the cornerstone of our relationship with Jesus is faith. That we come by faith. We are justified by faith alone. We're we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, right? And not of works, lest no one should boast, for we're his workmanship, created Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. And so that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And that's just a beautiful statement of how we came in. One day the people uh, that were talking to Jesus asked him, said, what can we do to do the works of God? And I love Jesus' answer. It, it's a startling answer. It throws you right off. He said, well, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. You see, there's the heart of it. You came in by faith, right? If you didn't come in by faith, you haven't come in yet. If you came in by, by church membership, you, you haven't come in yet. If you came in because somebody baptized you when you were a baby, you haven't come in yet. If you came in because you, you made a decision to be a better person, you haven't come in yet. If you come by faith, you have to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus trusting in him his righteousness when he died on that cross he took the full weight of your sin he took everything he paid the full price of your sin when he rose from the dead you were declared justified in him through the blood of jesus the bible tells us that we're justified through his blood we are sanctified by his blood we are uh, redeemed by his blood through j the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's how you came in. Now, here's what Paul says in verse 6. This is, this is key. He says, as you receive Christ, had you receive him by faith, right? So walk in him. So walk in him. So if I came in by faith, I got to keep walking by faith, right? Now, Paul in, in Galatians, he had an argument with people who were trying to earn their place in heaven by keeping regulations. And, and he said, look, are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit, but you're going to complete it in the flesh? Well, that's ridiculous. Well, how many of us do that, though? We get saved by faith. We believe that Jesus has enough power to save us from the penalty of our sin, but then we don't trust him to help us overcome sin, and we don't trust him to help us to grow. Then, okay, Lord, I'll take it from here. Thanks for saving me. I'm going to earn my way to heaven from here on out, and I'm going to fill myself up with rules and regulations and all this kind of stuff and try to make a way for myself so that I can tell you how great a job I did while I was on the earth. And sometimes this preacher falls into that. I think, oh, I've got to be good enough. And, and you know what? I have to constantly be brought back to the gospel of Jesus. That he has redeemed me by his blood. He has saved me by his grace. There is not a thing I can do to improve on what he has done. So I'm saved by faith. Now I walk by faith. Then in verse 7, he kind of opens that up a little bit and says what that looks like. Let me read verse 7. He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. In other words, rooted and built up in him. Jesus said it like this in John 15. He said, abide in me and I in you, as a branch can't bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. We Listen, you've got to not only come to Jesus by faith, you've got to have a growing faith relationship with him. You've got to stay in touch with him, being rooted in him. How do you get rooted in him? 
Well, first of all, by spending time with him. I'm always, uh, I'm always taken aback when people, I ask people, hey, are you saved? Oh, yeah, I took care of that back when I was 12. They're 45 years old and they haven't talked to God since, except at mealtimes. Here's the thing, guys, that, that's, that's just not salvation. I don't know, that, that was a religious act, but that's not salvation. Salvation is when, when I get into a relationship with Jesus because he's my Savior, and I, I need him all the time. Martin Luther, I heard this morning, Martin Luther said that our life is a life of repentance. I would say a life of repentance and faith, that, that our whole life we're repenting of sin, aren't we? I mean, I'm, I'm still repenting, aren't you? Um, I'm turning from my old self and I'm turning to the new life all the time. And I'm, but I only do that by staying connected to him. So I stay, how do you, how do you stay close to Jesus? Well, in his word, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples. Well, friend, what's the antithesis of that? If you don't continue in my word, you're not truly my disciples. So the person who says, yeah, I got saved, but I don't, speak, I don't read my Bible, I don't pray, I don't talk, I don't do any of that stuff, but I took care of it when I was a kid. No, you didn't. You made yourself feel better for a few minutes, whether you were at camp or church or wherever you needed to feel better, but you didn't get born again. Because, yeah, I will say it, because getting born again means that something has happened and I have changed and I'm in a relationship with Jesus. And if you, the, the, how do I know that I'm saved? By walking with him. That's how I know. Jesus said that. He said, you know, by this, all, they'll know you're my disciples. If you love each other, you're still walking in that love. He said, look, by this, my father's glorified that you bear fruit and prove to be my disciples. So I've got to be rooted in him by spending time with him and by being obedient to him and by trusting in him, relying on Jesus to meet my needs. You know how I know prayer works? Because I've had to ask for help a whole lot. You know how I know forgiveness works? Because I've had to ask forgiveness a whole lot. You know how I know what the Word of God says? Because I open it up and read it, and I get it in my heart. I don't sit around wishing I knew more. I get in it. And so look, here's the thing. I've got to be rooted in Him. Now some people are rooted in their denomination, but they're not rooted in Jesus. They're more interested in the fact that I'm, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Catholic, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, but you're not in him. You see, this is a personal contact. This is a personal relationship with, with God himself. And so I'm not asking you to see how religious you can become. I'm asking you to connect with Jesus in a personal way through prayer. Talk to him, listen to him through the word of God. This is simple stuff. This is so basic, and most Christians aren't, well, I wouldn't say most, many Christians aren't doing it. Worshiping him, do you just praise and worship God? This is an area I need to grow in, personal worship. I'm asking God to help me with that, help me do better with that. Um, worshiping him, loving people. Loving people is a way that we, we grow in him. It's not just how we show we love him, it's how we grow in love. The more I show love to people, the more I grow in love, right? Right? And so this is when you take your faith and you let it engage your life. You don't just kind of get it and get over it, get it and get over it. That's what a lot of people have done. A lot of people try to get saved from God. In other words, I just, I'm tired of God dealing with me. I'm going to go up to the altar. I'm going to pray, say the sinner's prayer, get baptized, and now I'm done. Then I can go on back to my life. You're wasting your time. You are. You're wasting your time. Listen, Christ doesn't call me to a one-time religious activity that makes me feel better about my sins. Christ calls me to a daily relationship with him whereby I deny myself, take up my cross daily and follow him, where I trust him by faith and I live by faith. Now, so this is the thing, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. That means that you are firm and settled in who you are in God. Now, he gives us a warning after this point. He says, look, you've got to be careful. Verses eight and nine, verse 8, he says, see to it that nobody takes you captive. Don't get taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Now, in, in Paul's day, when he talked about vain philosophy, the, the, the Greek world was filled with with philosophy and philosophy in itself isn't a bad thing 
but it needs to go through the filter of Jesus. Philosophy that doesn't line up with what Jesus said. He, he's, the, uh, he's the great interpreter of all philosophy. He's the great wellspring of true philosophy. And so uh, philosophy that lines up with him is great. It's a way of learning wisdom and that kind of thing. That's great. But, but then there's philosophy that pulls away from him. And he, Paul says, don't, don't get into that. The other thing is uh, traditions of this world. You know, there, there are things the world values that Christians don't value. That when the world when the world talks about uh, wealth and power and and money and and all these kinds of things, well, those aren't values for the for the Christian life, and uh, it saddens me when I hear preachers uh, talk to people about how to how to be more worldly. My goodness, this is how do you how do you can how do you be more like the world instead of how do you get out of the world? Then there's elemental spirits, and what is elemental spirits now? The, the, that would take a lot of explanation, but back in the, in the days of Paul, the elemental spirits had to do with pagan worship because those pagan rituals are not just silly religious things. They are demonic, that they are getting in touch with true, real demonic spirits and real demonic forces, things like witchcraft, uh, pagan worship, um, astrology, those kinds of things, star worship, earth worship, nature worship. What that does is people don't realize it's not just something silly. It taps in to something demonic. There are real demonic forces out there in the world today. And in our highly rationalistic Western culture, we often cringe at the thought of that. But the fact is, it's true. That, that there, we do wrestle against principalities and powers and forces of darkness in this world. Paul wasn't kidding. That did not go out of style in the 21st century. It's still here. But so what happens is that sometimes the things we do tap into demonic forces. Sometimes, I'll tell you this, I'm not going to give you a checklist of what kind of songs to listen to, but there are certain types of music um, because of the themes that they present that actually uh, can influence you demonically. Um, and there are, th listen, I'll tell you this, if you're constantly angry, constantly bitter, one of the things to do is check out what are you listening to? Uh, what are you reading? What are you, what kind of messages are you putting into your heart and your spirit? Um, I heard a preacher once say, what entertains you, enters you. And that's really true. Well, listen, it, it, it's amazing to me that a Christian will sit down and watch demonic horror movies and be entertained by that and then wonder why they fight, fight depression and guilt and fear and shame all the time. And while I just don't know, I was sitting up watching the, the, the you know, Eddie Krueger or whatever, the, the demonic blah, blah, blah thing was going on. And, and I just don't understand why I started feeling all depressed. And, uh, well, you know, we've got to understand that there are elemental spirits of this world. If you're, I mentioned this yesterday, uh, if you're into, if you're trying to blend uh, Eastern religions with your Christianity, um, if you're all about karma, for example, well, you're opening yourself up to something demonic. Karma is not of the gospel. It's not of God. The other thing is, if you're doing astrology, if you're, if you're playing with the Zodiac, and um, some of you are playing with witchcraft, you think it's cute and fun. And, uh, you know, you're doing these things. And see, the thing is, is and I'm not trying to be a, a legalistic person here, but, but I'm telling you that things that tap into dark uh, spiritual things are real and they have an impact. Now, I know you don't want to hear that. You want to think it's all fun and games. But when you tap into that, what you're doing is you're opening your spirit up to it and see what you're doing. And Paul was worried about that. He's saying, look, don't do that. Don't get captive. Because what begins to happen is you begin to think you need something else besides Jesus. And here's where it gets a little more subtle. It gets a little more subtle with some of these cults that say, Jesus is great. We love Jesus as long as Jesus and our philosophy. Jesus and our... Listen, even churches that claim to be Christian, if they say Jesus and our way of doing religion... All, you can't be saved unless you're doing it our way. See, that's demonic. That, that, or that, that treads into some dark territory because what you're getting into is a, is a Jesus is not quite enough mentality and you open yourself up to the, to the enemy. And so and Paul would say, don't open yourself up to that kind of stuff. Don't get caught up in that, right? Don't get caught up in, the, uh, in cults that say, well, Jesus can save you if you're part of our group. 
uh, two of the biggest in our country, Mormonism and, and Jehovah's Witness. Uh, and, I, and I know that that may be offensive to some, but the fact is that it's Jesus and our set of regulations. Jesus and our special revelation. Jesus and our prophet. Jesus and, and I know that there are Christian churches that act just like that, and then they're kind of bordering that way too. Um, you know, when you start following people more than you follow Jesus, that in whatever church it is, I don't care if it's Baptist, Methodist, Pentecost, or whatever it is, if you're more caught up in your leader or your denomination than you are in Jesus, then you've got an idol. Then you're treading into the elemental spirits of this world, the traditions of men. And so you're getting into things. What we've got to do is Paul always wanted us to come back to Jesus because Christianity is not about Baptist and Methodist and Pentecostal and Catholic and it's about Jesus and and anything that pulls me away from him becomes a threat to my walk with him and so we've got to learn to stay true and Paul wraps this up this warning with a great word of assurance and I love the way he ends this in verses 9 and 10 it says for in him in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of God bodily you know what that means that <clears throat> that Jesus Christ in human is still in human form by the way resurrected immortal uh, powerful human form he he appeared uh, to his disciples in human form but he was full of the fullness of deity in him right and he's still like that today and we will be we will stand before him one day and you'll 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 look him straight in the eye and then all of the deity is in him and there's he's not sort of god he's not half god half man he's not a little bit god he's not a man who's enlightened by god he is god in bodily form which is just phenomenal but you know, if we could just, if, if he had stopped at verse 9, we would have reason to worship and celebrate and honor him. But he says something that's even more extraordinary in verse 10. Listen to verse 10. And you have been filled, there's that word filled again, in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Do you know what that means? First, he says Jesus has all deity. He is God in human form. But because Christ lives in you, guess what? You have been filled or made complete in him. Right? So that means that you have everything you need to follow him effectively. You have everything. You don't need Jesus and something else. You need him because in him is all the fullness of God, right? And if all the fullness of God is in him and he's living in you, what more could you possibly need? That's why he said he's the head of all rule and authority. What does this mean practically for you? Christ, if you're saved, if you're born again, you're not just a member of the Christian religion. You are infused and filled with the very presence of, the, of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. You've got him. And so what does that mean? That all authority is in him and you're walking in it. So <clears throat> you have access to everything about Jesus. You have access to his healing power. You have access to his holiness. You have access to his love. You have access to his strength. You have access to his wisdom. You have, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that you could possibly need. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 says it like this. That God has given you we have everything we need for life and godliness in him, right? In Jesus Christ, we have everything we need. You don't need anything else. You got him. So when Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 to be filled with the Spirit, constantly be filled with the Spirit, that means to constantly getting in contact with him, constantly relying on him, because he is the eternal source of everything you're going to need today. Look at it today. You're going to need some wisdom today. You're going to need some today. When you go out, you're going to need it. And guess what? You already have it. You may not feel it, but you've got it. You're going to need to love some difficult people today. You're going to run into some folks today. Man, they're going to try your patience. They're going to irritate you. They're going to, they're going to treat you unjustly, unfairly. They're going to say things and do things. But you know what? You're, you have access to his love. You've got the power to love that person the way he called you to. 
you know, you're going to get into situations where you're called to compromise your faith. You're going to be asked to water it down a little bit. You're going to be asked to tone it down just a little bit. Come on, turn, put that light under a bushel basket. We don't want to hear. We don't want to see it here. And you're going to need holy boldness. Well, you've got access to all the boldness that Jesus Christ has, and He can give it to you. And so you have it in dwelling in you. And that's why Paul's saying, don't get caught up in all this silly stuff. Who needs to know if you're a Leo or a Taurus? Who needs to think about that when I've got Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the head of all ruling authority. I've got everything I could possibly ever need. And you, you, you want me to go dabble in witchcraft? You want me to waste my time in, in pathetic magic? I know I'm going after him. What, why do I got to waste my time on something like that? That's like going out for a bologna sandwich when you've got filet mignon at the house. I mean, what would be the point, right? So listen, there is nothing out there that can even touch the power and glory and majesty of who Jesus is. The problem isn't that we don't have enough. There are people running around looking for experiences with God and looking for, i got to have one more. No, you don't. You, what you've got to do is, is not get another experience. You've got to rediscover the one you've already had. Some of us, just you've got to rediscover the Christ who's already in you. You know, here's an exercise that you can do in your prayer life. You can get up every day and you can begin with God. Sit up on your bed and before your happy little feet get into those bunny slippers, say something like this to God. Now I want you to try this. I want you to do this. Jesus, thank you that you're already here. Let's just do it right now. Right this minute. You and me, close your eyes. Let's pray. Let's do it. I want, I want you to practice this in your life. Jesus, thank you that you're already here. Thank you that you have redeemed me. You have saved me. You have filled me with your holy presence. Thank you that in you, I have everything I'm going to need for this day. I have all the wisdom, all the love, all the faith, all the strength, all the compassion. I may not feel it, but by faith, I have it. So Lord Jesus, walk with me today. Help me to walk with you. Lead me by the Spirit. I make myself fully open and available to you, that you may live through me according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know what, friends? Don't try to memorize that prayer. You get the heart of it. Say it in your own words. And just say it to God. God, I'm totally available to you because you've made yourself totally available to me. Yeah, isn't that great news? Isn't it good to know that he has totally given everything for you, and now he just asks you to, to give everything back to him? The big challenge isn't me getting more of God. I hear people all the time, and, I, and I've said it. I'm not... I'm not fussing at anybody. I've said this too. Uh, God, I need more of you, more of you, more of you. And I think that sometimes what we really need to begin to say is, God, I want you to have more of me. You've got all of God. You've got the Spirit. You've got Him. But does He have you? Does He have you? Are you giving Him access to your life? Are you saying, Lord, I want you to show me how you want me to do my job? I want you to show me how you want me to handle my marriage. And I want you to, to just love my spouse through me. I want you to love my kids through me, my parents through me. Lord, I want you to show me how you will be a good neighbor to the people around me. Lord, walk through Walmart with me today. I'm, I'm not kidding. This may sound funny to you, but I'm telling you the truth. When you're standing in that line... And you're trying to wait for that cashier, and that ice cream's melting, <laughs> and you got to get out the door, and that cashier is just lost in space somewhere. They might have a broken heart. They might need you to pray for them. And so you say, "Oh Jesus, I don't know what's going on here, um, but I put first of all, I put my my situation in your hands. I know you're going to take care of it. But Lord, right now, what do you want to do with me in this line?" Is there somebody I can encourage? Is there somebody I can pray for? I know it's hard to get your mind on that when you're stressed out. That's the point. That's the point. It's when you're stressed out and you're freaked out that you can come to him and say, Lord, I need you right now to, to live through me. But don't wait till you get stressed out to do it. Start your day that way. And from time to time during the day, stop and be with him. 
Because this Christianity is not about you trying to see how religious you can be for God. It's about you walking in a real, supernatural relationship with Him moment by moment, day by day. Talk to Him throughout the day. Don't give up just because you had your quiet time this morning. Talk to Him throughout the day. Listen to His voice. Be in relationship with Him because He's got everything you need today. He's got everything you need today. So I want to encourage you today that when you leave, when you get up from this computer and turn off this cell phone, which you should probably, and you start connecting with people, go in the strength and the power of God and know that he is just as real now as he was when he walked this earth. Listen, God bless you today. Go in peace.